Uh, you have the outline of where we're going today, except I'm going to preach a sermon, but I'll do that before lunch because I think um, I'm going to preach uh, a sermon on a difficult, probably the most difficult part, I think, of preaching through Acts. But before I get to that, uh, just prior to lunch, I want to move through uh, the material that you've got there uh, on your outline, Acts, the Cinderella of the New Testament. So before lunch, I want to look in overview at Acts and what it's about and the sorts of things that we ought to keep in mind as preachers as we come to the book of Acts. Then I want to preach just before lunch. Then after lunch, we'll finish that off and I want to look at uh, a way in which I would prepare sermons and then uh, if we've got time, I'll preach another sermon at the end of the day, but we'll see how we go. Well, as you see there, Acts, the Cinderella of the New Testament. I, it, that's what Acts has been called, but it makes ugly sisters of John and Romans, of course, if you take that view, because Acts sits between two of the giants of the uh, what are called the inner canon of the Bible, John and Romans. But Acts is an important book because it is like, like a staging post between the Gospels and the Epistles. You stop off in Acts. I think very often Acts is not preached, however, because it's seen to be a seedbed of schism. That is, uh, there's a lot of dissension in the way people uh, read Acts and understand Acts. I think it is an example of the only pure narrative in the New Testament. Now, I'm not saying the Gospel is not narrative, but in the Gospel you have the actions of Jesus plus his interpretive word. Whereas in Acts, what you've got is simply the actions of the early church. Luke, as the author, is adding some narrative points as well. But I think it is pure narrative. And so your big problem when you come to pure narrative, say in Acts, is do you treat Acts like a church manual? That is, that here we have a model of how we are always to be baptising people and when we are to be baptising people. Do we have a model here of church government and how the church is to be governed? And I guess um, more prominently and importantly today that we come to Acts and say we have a model here of how we are to experience the Holy Spirit. So a Pentecostal experience. I guess the big issue when you come to Acts is to, to decide, um, is it merely descriptive or is it prescriptive? That is, is Luke telling us what happened merely, this is what happened, or is he prescribing that that which happened in the first century is to continue to happen all the way through? Um, and so I would have thought that if it is going to be prescriptive, then it needs to be taken up by the more didactic sections of the scripture, that is the epistles. An important issue, of course, when we come to Acts is why Luke wrote. So if you'd like to go back to Luke chapter 1, remember that Luke wrote volume 1 as um, the Luke Gospel of Luke and volume 2 is the book of Acts. And although he gives us in verses 1 and 2 of Acts an introduction to Acts, he gives us a larger introduction in Luke 1, 1 to 4. And it's important, therefore, when we're preaching to keep in mind the author's intent. What did the author intend his work to do? Now, much of what he says here in Luke 1, 1 to 4 is taken up in Acts 1, 1 to 2. But let's just read this. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. I just want you to know here that he doesn't say the things which have happened among us. What has happened, Luke sees, is a fulfilment of a definite purpose. God is at work, God has a purpose, and what I'm recording for you is the fulfilment of God's purpose. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So Luke is saying his sources are eyewitnesses and servants or preachers of the word. His method, verse 3, therefore I myself have currently invest carefully investigated everything from the beginning and it seemed good to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. So you'll see there that he has carefully researched and he is setting forward a very ordered account in which context is important. Now, of course, context is always important, but he's saying that in Luke and Acts, context is particularly important. And he's writing for Theophilus. We don't know who he is. His name means lover of God. We don't know whether he was a lover of God. We, we, he was probably Luke's patron, and therefore he paid Luke for preparing this account. He may have been some sort of administrative official for the Romans. We simply don't know. And so that's his method. That's his source. That's what he's writing about, verse 1. Verse 4, so that you may, of the things you have been taught, have certainty. And you'll notice that one of the characteristics of Luke's writing is that he loses, uses his last words well. And in the Greek text, the last word in verse 4 is the word certainty. 
That is, so that you may, of the things you have been taught, have certainty. I want you to be sure about these, that, that these things happened and therefore that is what he is leading to. Now, what does he want Theophilus to be certain about? Uh, if you go over, you would find the linchpin between volume one and volume two is at the end of volume one and the beginning of volume two. So if you go over, please, to Luke chapter 24, verses 46 to 48. Now, Luke 40, 24, 46 to 48 is a tremendous chapter because, of course, here, when we're talking about pastoral practice these days, we often go to the pastoral epistles. But here in Luke 24, you are seeing the pastoral practice of the chief shepherd of the sheep, the Lord Jesus himself, risen from the dead, and you see what he's often doing. For example, he goes to the two men on the Emmaus Road, two men who are on the fringe of things, and he's constantly telling them and the disciples the scriptures. Look at verse 45. He opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So if you look at verse 46, this is what is fulfilled. Verse 46 is a very good summary of the whole of the Gospel of Luke. The Christ will suffer, rise from the dead on the third day. So the life, suffering, death, resurrection of Jesus, which is what the Gospel is all about. And verse 47, repentance, forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So that is an excellent summary of volume two, the gospel starting in Jerusalem and heading out to the ends of the earth. I just want you to note the connective because we often overlook the connective and yet it's the overlooking of the connective which I think is one of the primary problems that we are facing in the church in Sydney today and you may be facing it as well. The connective being the word and in verse 47. And the Christ will suffer rise from the dead on the third day and repentance, forgiveness of sins will be preached to his name. In other words, it is as much the purpose of God that verse 47 be fulfilled as that verse 46 be fulfilled. That goes without saying, but it is the reality. You deny verse 46 and you're a rank heretic, aren't you? The, su the life, suffering, death and resurrection of Jesus. But in where I come from, you deny verse 47, and you're not a rank heretic, you're orthodox. Because we deny verse 47 its reality continually. We're always saying in Australia, all oh, the mission fields come to us. In a way it has, my own church's testimony to that fact, a thousand Chinese people every Sunday. But China's not empty, and Africa's not empty, and we can sit back comfortably and say, well, let them come to us, like Jonah, let Nineveh come to me. No. There's still people out there and it is the purpose of God, as much the purpose of God, that verse 47 be fulfilled as verse 46 be fulfilled. So we're constantly to be out looking. Now that's why Lloyd-Jones, when he comes to Westminster Chapel, 55 to 68, preaches through Romans on Friday night, he dedicates all those volumes of his sermons to the faithful and enthusiastic Friday nighters. And yet when he comes to sums things up, he says, and I quote, I know of no greater tonic in the realm of the spirit than a thorough reading of that book. And you'd think he'd be talking about Romans. He's not. He's talking about the book of Acts. I know of no greater tonic in the realm of the spirit than a thorough reading of the book of Acts. Because it is a constant reminder to us that we are to be out looking that repentance and forgiveness of sins is, it continues to go on and we are to continue to work for them. Now, the bridge, if you flip over to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, here you find uh, in verse 8 the geographical outline of the book of Acts. Jesus, just prior to his ascension, says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So in other words, the gospel is going to go to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to the suburbs of Judea, and then out to Samaria, and then finally to the ends of the earth. And notice Jesus says in verse 4, don't you leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. In other words, they think they're prepared. They've been with the living Christ on earth. There's no better preparation theological college than that. But he says, you're not prepared yet. Don't you go. You wait 
until the Holy Spirit comes on you. And Luke has already reminded us in verse 2 that everything which Jesus did in his humanity, he gave instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. It was the Holy Spirit who empowered our Lord Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit who is to empower the apostles. And here they are to wait, therefore, for the Holy Spirit to come. And the Holy Spirit is going to enable witness. He's going to empower witness for us to throw off our reserve and to move towards people with the gospel of Jesus. And so how does all this work? Look at the structure of Acts there. Uh, chapters 1 to 7, you see the gospel going from Jerusalem into the suburbs of Judea. Peter is the primary apostle and he is basically focused on reaching the Jews. Then from chapters 8 to 12, you have the gospel going into Samaria, the semi-Jewish territory, and you have a transitional period now. The focus is shifting from Peter now to Paul, and from Jewish evangelism, you now have the first indications of Gentile evangelism. And then from chapters 13 to 28, you have the beginning of the missionary journeys. Paul becomes the prominent apostle, and now, though the Jews are not left behind, there is always that priority. Now you have the full-orbed emphasis on non-Jewish evangelism, Gentile evangelism. That's from chapters 13 to 28. And so you've got the gospel moving out. Uh, John Wesley said, God buries his messengers, but not his message. Here is the fulfilment of God's plan. Luke 24, 47, repentance, forgiveness in Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth. Hostility will come against the gospel from Jewish religious authorities. Stephen will be martyred. Tertullian said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Stephen's martyrdom doesn't slow down the gospel. It is the catalyst for the gospel to be taken up and go out into Samaria. Eternal hypocrisy, Ananias and Sapphira, the grumbling widows in chapter 6, they do not stop the gospel. Hostility from business interests, the fortune teller's owners in Philippi or the craftsmen of Ephesus. It does not slow the gospel down. Theological dissension within the church. Chapter 15, what is the nature of the gospel? Should it include circumcision? It doesn't slow the gospel down. Persecution, jail, Stephen, James put to death, Paul stoned, Paul flogged, court cases, Paul shipwrecked, snake bite, all under God's superintendency. It must be fulfilled. The gospel is unstoppable. And therefore, this, studying this book will help us really be encouraged as we are reminded of the power of the gospel. Now, the first thing I would like to do in uh, starting a series on Acts is just to network a diagram, a network of Acts narrative. So if you'd like to look at that one, uh, it looks like that, the network of Acts narrative. These are reproduced as well in the book that you've been given today. Um, now, I like uh, a few years ago, each of my, I have five children um, and four of them are married. And so a couple of Christmases ago, I gave three of my sons-in-law what I believe to be the indispensable tool for every preacher, because all of them are preachers. I gave them for Christmas a pencil. Now, I'm real Scottish, okay? Uh, I gave them a nice pencil. But I think, I think with my pencil in my hand, I'm not a computer type person who thinks on the, whatever that is, the keyboard, I think it's called. I don't think with that. I think with a pencil. And so what I want to do, therefore, is network what this book is all about. So let's just move through it and get this Google overview of the book of Acts. We're in Jerusalem on the top line. Okay, Christ ascends. And then the gospel moves on, chapter 2, the Spirit descends. And as a result of the Spirit coming down, Peter and John heal the crippled beggar in chapter 3 and preach. And the first opposition is from the Jewish religious authorities. So the arrow is moving against the gospel from the Sanhedrin. But that doesn't stop the gospel and the gospel goes out and you've got the internal hypocrisy of Ananias and Sapphira and the grumbling widows complaining that they are being disfavoured in the daily distribution of food, but this doesn't slow the gospel down. As a result of that grumbling of the widows, you've got election of the seven deacons of whom one is Stephen and Stephen attracts the attention of the authorities 
because they can't seem to overcome him in debates. And as a result of this, he's dragged before the Sanhedrin and Stephen is martyred. And as a result, a result of that, chapter 8, verse 1, the church or those from outside of Jerusalem are then spread back outside of Jerusalem. And uh, the example we follow is Philip who goes to Samaria. Now we are now in Samaria and we are now with one of the deacons, Philip, who is ministering in Samaria and finding great response from the semi-Jews. Remember the Samaritans were of the 10 tribes of the north of Israel who intermarried with the Assyrians. So they were looked down on very much by the Jews from Judah and Benjamin. So there's great response to the gospel. And as a result of that, the gospel goes on. And in chapter 9, you have the conversion of Saul for the Gentiles. Then in chapter 10, you've got Peter having the vision that the gospel is actually for Gentile Christians because that was news for Peter. And then when you come to chapter 13, you've got Barnabas and Saul being sent out from the church in Syrian Antioch to go on their first missionary journey. At the end of that first missionary journey, there is theological dissension in the church. That's to be expected. Um, and therefore, you've got the Jerusalem Council meeting in 49 AD. And they've got to decide whether or not the gospel is faith in Christ alone or faith in Christ alone plus circumcision. Well, they resolve that issue. We'll look at that later. And the second missionary journey comes on with Paul and Silas going out. And of course, Barnabas teams up now with Mark. And you've got the second missionary journey when they go into Europe for the first time. Then Paul, Silas and Timothy go on the third missionary journey. And as they get into Gentile territory, the opposition isn't so much religious. The opposition now is commercial from the uh, silversmiths in Ephesus. But the gospel goes on triumphantly. Paul comes to Jerusalem and when he's back in Jerusalem, it's the religious authority of the Sanhedrin who oppose him. But he goes on and the Romans intercede at this point and take him prisoner. And Paul is before Governor Felix. Then he comes before Governor Festus. There's the court appearances. And I think it's at this point that the narrative in a sense gets bogged down. And that's why I'm going to preach a sermon on chapters 24 to 26 a little later. Uh, is, is the gospel going to be stopped by the litigation from the Romans? No, rather the gospel goes on and you've got the trip and the arrival at Rome and Paul has to look, after, look out for a storm and shipwreck and snake bite finally when he comes on Malta, but he safely lands in Rome and the brothers welcome him. And it's just a great network. So we see that the gospel, therefore, has reached from the east, Jerusalem, through Judea, Samaria, and then it's come over to the Western Empire, to Rome, and there is still further for it to go. Now, we know that because Paul writes to the Romans because he wants the Roman church to be a staging post, just as Syrian Antioch church was a staging post for mission. He wants the church in Rome to be a staging post for mission. And so he says in Romans 15, I want to go further west to Spain and to what was then known as the Rock of Hercules. It was thought if you sailed past the Rock of Hercules, you would fall off the world. Now he wants to take the gospel as far west as he possibly can. Sorry, he didn't have anything in mind for the UK, but he wanted to get to, to Gibraltar if he possibly could, to Hercules, and he wanted to get to Spain. So there's that open-endedness about the book of Acts. And if you look at the last verse in the book of Acts, it's interesting how Luke finishes and uses last words well. Uh, here is Paul in Rome. And if you've been to the, the uh, Jewish ghetto in Rome, you'll know that if, if you know the Vatican and the Colosseum, so here's the Vatican and here's the Colosseum, and between them is the Tiber River, and if you walk from the Vatican down through on the banks of the Tiber River, you come to this section where all of a sudden you realise you're surrounded by synagogues and kosher butcheries. And you think, what's going on here? Jewish people everywhere. This is one of the oldest Jewish ghettos in the world. And sure enough, there is a building there where there's a plaque that says this is where the Apostle Paul was in prison for two years. So this is where he was ministering the gospel. Look at verse 31 of Acts 28. It reads like this in the original. He, Paul, 
preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ boldly and unhinderedly. The last word of Acts is the word unhinderedly. It's an adverb which qualifies a verb. So it's not an adjective, it's unhinderedly. So this gospel is powerful. This gospel is going on. This gospel hasn't yet reached its goal. But Acts is another narrative of how the gospel has gone from Jerusalem to Rome. But it is still open-ended and we need to continue to follow this gospel as it goes out. This is the God who has no pleasure in the death of the wicked and neither should we. This is the God who had to tell Jonah twice, go to Nineveh. This is the God who relents from sending calamity. And this is the God who sends his gospel out. And it's our privilege to be bearers of that gospel. All right, let's look at themes. Uh, was Luke a father? I can tell you Luke was a father. Uh, my studies, postgraduate studies, were in the area of ancient history. And you say, well, are you convinced as a historian that Luke was a father? Yes, I'm convinced that Luke was married with children. On what basis do you think Luke was married with children? Well, on this basis, it's not very historical, but... Uh, when he says anything important, he says it three times. So I think that's pretty good indication. Now, I'm telling you once, I'm telling you twice, I'm telling you three times. And everything that Luke says, which is of vital importance, he says three times. Now, that's fascinating, isn't it, in the narrative? Let's look at examples of this. First of all, the coming of the Holy Spirit. You'll know when you're in theological college, there was always a question when you did Acts. Validate the statement that the book of Acts has three Pentecosts. Yeah, sure it does. It has the Holy Spirit coming on the Jew. Jewish believers in chapter 2 in Jerusalem. In chapter 8 on the Samaritan believers or half Jews. And then in chapter 10 on Cornelius, the non-Jew. And in each of these cases, the Holy Spirit is poured out. Now, of course, here we need to handle the whole issue of the charisma. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, good. Um, uh, you'll know that uh, the issue here, when I started to uh, lecture on Acts at our college, um, I used to put the charismatic interpretation of Acts off until the last few lectures. But everybody really had, that was their great interest. So after a while, I did it as the very second lecture. Uh, now, you know, what, what, I what is the charismatic interpretation of Acts? Now, now, I know that when I define what is a charismatic understanding of your experience of the Holy Spirit, there will be many Pentecostals and charismatic who say, well, I don't believe that, and I readily recognise that. But I'm basically going on the Assemblies of God uh, statement of faith. Now, the Assemblies of God statement of faith says that the normal Christian experience of the Holy Spirit is that subsequent to conversion, so a person is converted... But it's subsequent to conversion as a separate act. They are baptised in the Holy Spirit. Now that subsequence might be a minute or two minutes after they've become Christians or it could be a year or two years later. And so you've got this definite two-step experience. The evidence of that experience that the baptism has come is the gift of tongues and the seeking, or the, the condition of receiving the baptism of the Spirit is that you seek the, the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm just simply setting that before you to say, well, let's examine that in the light of Acts because this is the area of uh, description, prescription, in which there is tension between brothers and sisters where there should not be tension, uh, but there will be. Do we see the doctrine of subsequence in chapter 2? Yes, of course we do. We would expect that those who were with Jesus and therefore did not have the Holy Spirit because they were in the presence of Jesus on earth and the Holy Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was with them, you would expect that for those unique people, about 120 people, they would have a two-stage experience of salvation. That is, their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, as Luke tells us, but they do not receive the Holy Spirit because he is not yet given until Acts chapter 2. So I can understand why there would be subsequence there and their unique experience of the 120 years to have a subsequent experience of the Holy Spirit. But I don't see, for example, why in verse 41 of chapter 2, the 3,000 will have that experience. Now, I'm simply raising this here because you're going to have to deal with this and the extent to which you deal with this is entirely up to you in your own congregations how much this is an issue. Uh, in my own congregation, this is an issue. So we're going to have to deal with it. 
Um, secondly, in chapter 10, let's deal with Cornelius, the third example. Uh, you've got Cornelius, the God-fearer, and I take it, therefore, that Cornelius was one of a, uh, of a class of people in the synagogue of Jews uh, without being converts to Judaism who were God-fearers, and there was a whole group of them. There were a lot of God-fearers who were attached to the synagogue without necessarily being proselytes, that is, converts to Judaism. They might have uh, appreciated the, the unity of God, the one God. They might have appreciated the fact that knowing this God changes the, you, the way you live, the way you spend your money, the way you eat, the way you have a Sabbath rest. Whatever attracted a man like Cornelius to the synagogue, he had not totally identified with Judaism because he was yet uncircumcised. So the only difference, therefore, between a God-fearer and a proselyte was the issue of circumcision. Now, therefore, I take it that Cornelius is an unbeliever. He is a believer in God, but he's not a Christian believer. And although he is a man who is greatly respected, he yet still has to come to Christ. And it's not till verse 44 of chapter 10, while Peter was still speaking these words, that the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. And it's at that point that Cornelius and his friends... Uh, know that they are now belong to Christ. So it's not a subsequent experience. They come to Christ and they are baptised in the Holy Spirit. So that leaves us with chapter 8, which is the most problematical of the areas. So if you'd like to go back there, um, God was at work and we'll take up the reading from chapter 8, verse 14. And this is the ground for, uh, foundation for the Holy Spirit baptism as a subsequent experience. And by the way, this is also the ground, if you're an Anglican or a Presbyterian, for the doctrine of confirmation, right? So the bishop comes or whoever it is and uh, lays hands on the young confirmee and they receive the Holy Spirit. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, these are people who had accepted the gospel but had not yet received the Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptised into the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, you'd think, well, is that an inadequate name? Well, it's not a Trinitarian name. So the point there probably is that they were not baptised in the name of the Father, Son and Spirit but simply into the bapti baptised into the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. Now, there are the three verses. Now, is that merely descriptive? Well, that's what happened. So it is descriptive, but it is prescriptive. Is it to be taken up? And how can we understand that? Well, you've got to, you've got to work on that. But that's the, that, I think, is the most difficult one to explain. But am I going to, at that point, build a doctrine of subsequence there when the epistles don't seem to argue for a doctrine of subsequence? And the epistles seem to argue that the Spirit shows himself in his fruit, not in any particular gift. So why does the Holy Spirit come in this two-stage experience? Could it have something to do with the fact that these were believers in Samaria and they had to understand that though before Christ, before being Christian, there was a division between Jew and Samaritan, that that division between Jewish church and Samaritan church was no longer to be tolerated, and the Samaritans had to realise, the believers, that they had received the Spirit from the hands of the Jerusalem apostles, and therefore that they were to submit, therefore, as part of the apostolic church in Jerusalem. And could it be important as well for Peter and John to note that the reality of the Holy Spirit had been given to these Samaritan believers just as he had been given to the Jewish believers in chapter 2 and the Samaritans therefore were not second-class citizens in that sense. So it may well be very important that this two-stage experience could happen to the Samaritans both for their sake and for, say, for the sake of the apostles and the thinking of the Jerusalem church toward the Samaritan church, etc. So you've got to work that out, I think. 
But I think that that is a, is a good explanation of why that happens, particularly on the basis that when Paul is writing to the Ephesians, he seems to make it quite clear in chapter 1 that to come to Christ and believe the gospel is to receive the Holy Spirit and there is to be no wedge driven between the acceptance of Christ and the acceptance of the Spirit. And it is significant as well that when Paul comes to the disciples of John the Baptist in chapter 19 of Acts, who've never heard of the Holy Spirit, he teaches them about Jesus. So you know Spurgeon's words, I looked to the dove and it flew away. I looked to the cross and the dove flew into my heart. So you come to Jesus and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. And we should not be driving a wedge between Jesus and the Spirit. So the sermon at Pentecost is all about Jesus. It's not about the Spirit. It's all about the Lord Jesus. All right, I will do Saul, Paul, and then we'll stop, okay, uh, for questions and comments. Chapter 9, uh, Paul's conversion and commissioning. So in Acts 9, you've got Saul, like Isaiah, who was called and converted and commissioned. Now, I think that's an interesting thing to make as a preacher. When you are converted, are you commissioned for service? Yes, why? Because Paul was, because Isaiah was? No, that's simply descriptive. No, well, therefore, is it prescriptive that every person is converted is a commissioned servant of Christ? Well, I think you can argue on the base of 1 Peter chapter 2 that that is to be the normal Christian experience. However, here is the experience of Paul. Notice he's on the Damascus Road. Saul, Saul, verse 4. Why do you persecute me? There's the solemn repetition of the name, just as Moses, Moses, uh, when God appeared to him in the burning bush. Now it's Saul, Saul. So this is a theophany experience. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. We'll look more at that later. This is repeated fully in chapter 22, and it is repeated fully before Festus and King Agrippa in chapter 26. And you may well say, well, why doesn't Luke simply refer us to the previous scroll? But he doesn't. He tells us about chapter 9, the conversion of Saul. He repeats it and adds to it in chapter 22. And then he repeats it again in chapter 26. Can't he refer to a previous scroll? He doesn't do that. Why? Because this is a significant conversion for the movement of the gospel. There's no insignificant conversions, but this is one that's going to mean the gospel will be going to the ends of the earth. Now, just flip over, if you would, to Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Um, and you'll know that this is a core verse in Paul, Saul, Paul's writing to the Roman congregation. He says in verse 16 of chapter 1 of Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Then in 17 he says, For in the gospel, that is in the momentous news of God, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, and here's Habakkuk 2, the righteous will live by faith. Now what is Romans all about? It is all about how unrighteous people can be in a righteous relationship with the righteous God forever. And how can that happen? That can happen on the basis of faith in someone, not works. See, whenever Paul's writing about faith, the antithesis of faith is works. And so this God righteousness, this righteous standing, is revealed from God and it is through faith, not works. Now you'll know that the Augustinian monk Martin Luther when he was asked, as you ask any Muslim today, by the way, do you love God? I always ask a Muslim, do you love Allah? And I have never yet had one Muslim say to me they love Allah. They reverence Allah, they fear Allah, they worship Allah, but I've never had one volunteer the word love. Now Martin Luther, when he was asked, do you love God? He said, no, I hate him. On what basis? Because he read righteousness as God's requirement. And then, you remember, he felt the doors of paradise opened because he realised that righteousness was God's provision. That which God required, God provided. And of course you'll know that when he wrote his commentary on Romans, um, 
a couple of hundred years later, there was a man sitting in London listening to Martin Luther's introduction to his commentary on Romans, and John Wesley felt his heart strangely warmed. And his brother Charles, the great hymn writer, was converted as he is reading through Martin Luther's commentary on Paul's letter to the Galatians. So not only is this a significant conversion in the book of Acts, but this is a significant conversion for the ongoing history of the church. One writer says this, essentially the measure of Europe's freedom is the measure in which she has obeyed the principles of Christianity. Now that's a fascinating thing. And in all my travels, I don't think you notice that more than here in Scotland. Um, my wife went out to, to look at John Knox's house in St Giles Presbyterian Cathedral today. I said, don't get your hopes up and don't make a scene, please. <laughs> because it may well be that in John Knox's house, they just want to blank out any religious significance of the man. I remember coming over here and going on a tour and driving down Princess Street and the man standing up the front in all his doodah, all his Scottish kilt and everything, and he's rolling his arras like this and being a real Scot. He said, here is a monument to David Livingstone, Austro uh, uh, Scotland's greatest explorer. <laughs> That's his Scotland's greatest explorer? So as we were walking up the Edinburgh Castle, I said, surely Livingstone was more than an explorer. No, he was only an explorer. But he went out as a missionary of the London Missionary Society. And when he was asked, where do you want to go? He said, anywhere, as long as it's forward in the name of Christ. So you've got to say more than he was an explorer. No, this man wouldn't hear of it. He was just an explorer. Let Glasgow flourish by the preaching of the word and the praising of his name. That's the motto of the city of Glasgow. What is it today? Let Glasgow flourish, full stop. And my observation, Glasgow ain't flourishing. So you turn your back on these things as we turn, see, we've got no Christian heritage to turn our back on in Australia. But I went to Cambridge, a Christian tour of Cambridge. Wilberforce, Latimer, Ridley, Cranmer, Isaac Newton, C.S. Lewis, it's all there. But you get onto a secular tour and you never hear about it. We are very careful, aren't we, to cut ourselves off from the past. The measure of Europe's freedom is the measure in which she has obeyed the principles of Christianity. Well, here is a key. Uh, conversion for the conversion of Europe uh, in chapter 9, chapter 22 and chapter 26. It's really a great catalytic conversion. Right, I'll stop. Uh, comment and questions, please. Right, Kipling said, six faithful men taught me everything I knew. What, when, where, why and how and who? That's their names. Any questions or comments? Yeah. 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 So there's something for everyone there, isn't there, in that verse? There's something for the Baptists, because you go and get baptised as a mark of your repentance. There's something for the Presbyterians, because the promise is to your children as well. And uh, so we're all happy. <laughs> and um, so there, there, but there it is, you're right. So this, this is, if you repent and baptise, two things will happen. You'll be forgiven. God will take your sins and deal with them and give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yep. Okay, anybody else? Thanks for that. All right, uh, yes. You just made the argument for um, subsequent in Acts chapter 2, and so what immediately comes to my mind is Jesus Christ uh, breathing um, inside the saints, receiving the Spirit. Yeah, in Ch John 20. Yeah, that's a good one. You've got to work that one out. And you've got to work out the relation. Is that John's Pentecost? That's what you've got to work out. And I take it that that is John's Pentecost. And what we've got, therefore, in Luke Acts is a fuller picture of how all that works. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I would like to ask a question about false missionaries or conversions. Is it important in some of the 
Uh, well, I think he definitely was converted because he's actually go, goes to the synagogue in Damascus and immediately begins to preach that Jesus is the Son of God. So I think he's definitely been converted because he's changed his whole attitude to the Lord Jesus. And he is certainly commissioned at the same time. But Isaiah, uh, he gets touched, he's cleansed. Who will go for us? Here am I, send me. So immediately he's cleansed, he is also sent. So I would think Paul is definitely converted. And when Ananias comes to him, he says, it makes it quite clear, you're going to carry my name to the Jews and the Gentiles and their kings, and you're going to suffer a lot. So there's a clear commissioning. Where the, sorry, where? Yeah. Yeah, John 7, he'll be given after I'm taken up. The, uh, the, look, I'd, I'd just refer you to Acts 2.33, um, where the, the fact that Jesus is ascended to the Father's right hand, he's received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. So the idea is that the Father has, the Spirit is in presence with the Father and he pours out through the Son the promised Holy Spirit. So he is with the Father and now he is poured out through Jesus to his people. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's keep moving. Um, ne the next one we come to, the uh, three uh, repetitions, is Cornelius and Gentile inclusion in the purpose of God, chapter 10, uh, chapter 11 and chapter 15. So in chapter 10, you see Peter's reluctance because he didn't yet understand. If you just flip back to Luke 24, verse 47, and just remember that Peter was here listening to what Jesus said, and this is how Peter heard what Jesus said. Uh, Luke 24, verse 47, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to the Jews of all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now, that's, that's what struck Peter. Jesus didn't say that. He said to uh, be preached in his name to all nations. But, of course, Peter is thinking, oh, yes, but he means just to the Jews of all nations, surely not to the Gentiles. Now, if you come over to Acts chapter 10, you'll see that Peter has to have this vision and he is told in verse 12 to get up, Peter, kill and eat. And uh, in verse 14, surely not, Lord. There's a great sermon, by the way, of J.C. Ryle in which he says you can say surely not, but you can't also say Lord. If he's Lord, you don't say surely not. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. So what's happening here three times is that it's not appropriate to draw a distinction between food, clean and unclean. Uh, Mark makes that clear as well. Um, and that which is not appropriate to do with food is not appropriate to do with people either. So in other words, Cornelius is not unclean because he is a Gentile and that food is not unclean either. Now, if you go over to chapter 11, um, then uh, Peter makes it clear to the Jerusalem brethren that his experience of being with Cornelius um, so in verse 17, so if God gave them the same gift as he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When the Jerusalem believers heard this, they had no further objections and praised God saying, so then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. And then the third uh, indication of this is in chapter 15 where Peter comes to the Jerusalem council and he insists that Cornelius, they are insisting that Cornelius and the other Gentiles be circumcised, but Peter makes it clear that God has baptised Cornelius in the spirit and Cornelius was in an uncircumcised state. Brothers, you know, verse 7, that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believed, God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He made no distinction between them and us. He purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. And so God saved Cornelius 
in an uncircumcised state. Chapter 10, verse 36, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Chapter 10, verse 36. And that is the message which Cornelius had to hear as well. And he heard it in an uncircumcised state and he was baptised by the Spirit in an uncircumcised state. Just by the way, Paul says, as was Abraham our father. He was justified 14 years before he was circumcised. So Paul says, if you think what I'm saying, therefore, is somehow tied to circumcision, look at the experience of Abraham, who was declared righteous by God in Genesis chapter 15, but was not circumcised until Genesis chapter 17. So get the order right. In other words, Paul's saying, and if you think that somehow Abraham earned his righteousness by doing the law, look again at your history, because the law didn't come for another 400 years. So Abraham was right with God through faith. Right, that's Cornelius. Now Jerusalem Council, uh, Jerusalem Council chapter 15. And the letter of Jerusalem Council uh, is initially recorded for us in chapter 15, 19 to 21. It is repeated in chapter 15 again, and it is referred to again in chapter 21. And the letter goes like this. Verse 19, James says... It's my judgment that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals and from blood. For Moses had been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Now, that letter is repeated on three separate occasions. In other words, there is only one gospel, it is the gospel of Peter and Paul. Christianity is not a sect of Judaism, chapter 15. Neither is Christianity a philosophy like the Stoics and the Epicureans in chapter 17. Neither is Christianity political. So we're not declaring here another king in, com in uh, competition with Caesar. And neither is Christianity spiritism. Uh, look at the experience of the fortune-telling girl. She's very spiritual. I often say to people that I'm a Christian, and they'll say, oh, I'm very spiritual too. Christianity is not spiritism as such. And the girl who is the fortune-telling girl in 16 has to be converted to Christ. Christianity is all about Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the Son of David, the Son of Man, the Lord. He's the prophet like Moses. He's the holy, and he's the righteous one. If you look over to chapter 20, verse 21, I think chapter 20 is one of those amazing chapters in Acts. Paul says, at the very heart of his ministry, uh, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. That is what Acts is all about. Repentance and faith is the direction of the apostolic preacher. And here in Luke Acts, we have one word which is repeated 40 times over. It is the little Greek word D-E-I, day. And it means it must happen. It must happen. It's all about fulfilment. The ascended Christ continues to direct the mission of the church. He is fulfilling his purpose. The gospel must reach the ends of the earth. It must happen day. Now let's look at over the page now we'll have a look at Luke's statistical summary because here is one of those occasions in which we see Luke's interest. So as the narrator he's showing us what he is interested in. So let's flip with our fingers. Let's start in chapter 2 and Luke is telling us giving a, says a statistical return. Chapter 2 verse 41 uh, those who were baptised on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 were added to the number that day. That's 41. And then 47, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So uh, we have this report of the health of the church. Uh, if you just go over to chapter 4, verse 4, you'll see that by then uh, the number of men had grown to about 5,000. And then the particular quality of these conversions, go to chapter 6, verse 7, so flip with your fingers here. The word of God spread, this is after the, the, the distension from the widows. 
the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests so that the gospel is penetrating deeply even into the priesthood of Judaism. Chapter 9, verse 31 uh, so you see that Paul here uh, leaves Damascus. He's uh, lowered over the wall in a basket. So he makes much of that when he talks about him as a super apostle in 2 Corinthians because the, the great hero is the first man over the wall into the city to vanquish the city. Paul says, well, I wasn't the first man over the wall. I was the last man out. And I wasn't over there in my great armour. I was actually taken and put in a basket and covered over and lowered over the wall. So I've got nothing to brag about. Verse 31, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. So peace and growth in the church. Chapter 12, verse 24. So these are little editorial comments by the narrator showing his interest. His interest is in the word. That's interesting, isn't it? The irony a book called Acts, and yet the focus is all about the word. Uh, chapter 12, verse 24, here you'll see Herod is eaten by worms and died, but by contrast to Herod, the word of God continued to increase and spread. The word of God was not eaten by worms and died, but Herod was. Um, chapter 16, verse 5, um, the churches were strengthened in faith, and grew daily in numbers. This is after the dissension between uh, Bar Barnabas and Paul, and yet the word of God continues on. Chapter 19, verse 20, uh, you remember the people bringing out their uh, magic scrolls and burning them. Um, verse 19, a number had practiced sorcery, brought out their scrolls and burned them. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, they came to about 50,000 drachmas, so a lot was burned. Whereas the scrolls were in ashes, verse 20, in this way the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. So Herod's eaten by worms and died, but the word of God wasn't eaten by worms and died. The sorcerer's scrolls were in ashes, but the word of God wasn't in ashes. So he's showing us again and again um, that this is the emphasis here. And what is interesting here, just read the text. Our preaching has got to, hasn't it, uh, reflect a deep reading of the text. Just look at the sons of Sceva here. Look at verse 13 in chapter 19. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. Now, that's Luke's comment. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Now, notice the difference. When Luke talks about the, the Lord Jesus, he says, the Lord Jesus, but the sons of Sceva don't give him that title. They just talk about Jesus. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them. Now notice what the, the evil spirit says. Jesus, not the Lord Jesus, but Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them, he gave them such a bleeding that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks, they were seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in honour. So whenever Luke refers to Jesus, it's to the Lord Jesus. When the sons of Sceva refer to the Lord Jesus, it's Jesus. When the demon refers to the Lord Jesus, it's just Jesus. So the distinctive element is the Lordship of Christ. By contrast, the word of God was not burnt. And then finally, chapter 28, the very last chapter, um, verse 23, they arranged to meet Paul on a certain day. From morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And verse 30, uh, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ unhinderedly boldly and unhinderedly. So that's Luke's, Luke's great passion. His passion is to show that that gospel is still going to the ends of the earth and it is to still to go to the ends of the earth. And an essential element of the Christian church is that we are involved in gospel planting. We're to be moving out to the ends of the earth. So if you get the Tyndale commentary from Blakelock, Ian Blakelock, which is the um, earlier Tyndale commentary on Acts, which is an incredibly good commentary. He sums up his introduction by saying that 
it is always sound policy to press beyond the fringe, provided it is done with vigour and devotion. Now, that's how Professor Blakelock, the professor of classics at Auckland University, sums up the Book of Acts. It is always sound policy to press beyond the fringe, the next street, the next house, the next suburb, the next city, the next country, provided it is done with vigour and devotion. Okay, that's by way of introduction. Now let's just have a look uh, over to sermon series because we're preachers and we've got to say, how do we think we're going to be preaching through this material? Okay, do you have any question or comment you want to ask so far? So that's just getting the overall theme and direction of Acts into our head. Anything there? That's our first hour. Now, do you want to ask a question or make a comment? Well, why don't we go for sexual immorality? Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, that, that, uh, to me, that's the strange thing. Eh? Can we leave that till we get to this overview? Because I think it's really interesting, isn't it? My, my father was a, an old Scot. Yeah. Every Sunday morning he made breakfast and it was black pudding. I loved black pudding, but I never knew what it was. Then when I found out what it was, I was disgusted, but I loved it so much that I ate it anyway. And it's what? It's ox blood, isn't it? That's what black pudding is. So what do you do with that? And what's black pudding doing together with sexual immorality? That, that's a strange thing. Well, leave it for the sake of liberty. Leave it for the sake of freedom. Hey, and lay off the pornography with you as well. It's better for you and for the sake of fellowship you don't do that either. That's a fascinating question. Thank you. <laughs> so we'll come to that. Sorry, anything else? Okay. All right, well, let's get into the text and let's look at the series. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run through the text of Acts and I'm going to make comments, okay? Uh, but I'm going to suggest the way it should be broken up. Now, how you break it up really is quite up to you and how it works here in Scotland. In Australia, we have four school terms. They're about 10 weeks each. And in between school terms, we have two or three weeks of vacation. So at our church, we often run a series for the school term. So we will run four series a year. Um, and we just move on from one series to the other. So we, for example, next year we are doing Acts. And we're going to do it in three school terms. So what I've got there is about 22 weeks. We're going to extend that a little bit and we're going to do three 10-week terms or three seven or eight-week terms. That'll take us for about 24 weeks. And then we're going to stop at the end of each school term. And uh, we might do term one on the first section of Acts, term two on the second section of Acts, then have a break, and we might do some Old Testament, and then term four on the next section of Acts. Though Luther said, um, I'm always encouraged by what Luther said. Why would you teach anything but Romans to a congregation that doesn't understand Romans? Now, I can't actually find where Luther said that, but I like it. <laughs> and I don't think my congregation understands Romans. And I'll guarantee you yours doesn't either. And what are we doing then? Not preaching justification by faith. I think it's a great truth to come, keep coming back to Romans. Anyway, don't let's get sidetracked on Romans. We should be teaching uh, Acts as well. Now, let's have a look here then. Uh, I'm going to assume we do Acts in 13 weeks and we'll start in chapter 24, 46 and 47 and Acts 1.8. Now, that's our introductory week. And I'm just going to show in that early sermon how uh, Luke puts an emphasis on the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives for witness. So everything that is accomplished in Acts is accompanied not in the power of human resource or human creativity, but is accomplished in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the big question I'm going to leave with people is, do you know the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life? And do you have confidence in the Holy Spirit to do his work? Now, I'm a Presbyterian. In Presbyterianism, you can get so involved in political issues that you forget that this is basically a spiritual issue and you can forget that this is to, everything we do is to be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And so in that first sermon, I'm going to be emphasising how everything Peter did, he did in the power of the Spirit, and Luke reminds us of that. And everything, for example, Stephen did, he did in the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and therefore, I'm going to be looking for illustrations to show that. For example, a few, few weeks ago, I was down with Kick You, the uh, Cambridge Intercollegiate Christian Union, uh, for a weekend of evangelism in Cambridge. And someone was talking to me about when D.L. Moody visited Cambridge and uh, how the Earl of Shaftesbury said that he'd been along to Moody and found that he was overwhelmed by the imperfection of everything in Moody. Moody's language was grammatically erroneous and uh, Shaftesbury just couldn't understand how the Holy Spirit could use someone like D.L. Moody. But he wondered that the Holy Spirit did. And Moody kept saying, but the work's not mine. The work's not mine. It is the Holy Spirit. And Moody himself is an example of a man who just knew the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. And apparently Moody stands up to the uh, congregation of Cambridge students who in those days, the late 19th, early 20th century, were the cream of the crop in England. And Ira Sankey had come out to sing the song and the students had hooted him and then out comes Moody and the first thing he says is, young gentlemen don't ever believe God don't love you, for he do. Now you think, that is dreadful. <laughs> that, uh, and then uh, he repeats it. Don't e young gentlemen don't ever believe that God don't love you, for he do. And there's a young man called C.T. Studd and another one called Wilford Grenfell and they cannot get that out of their mind. And so it just shows you that the Holy Spirit can use us in our imperfection. We don't strive to be imperfect. We don't have to do that. Uh, but the Holy Spirit can use us. So that's what I'm going to say in the first week. Okay, second week, Acts chapter 1. We now move on from the ascension. And in the ascension, I want to see the three main movements in Acts chapter 1. The three main movements are, one, the ascension in which Jesus is taken to the right hand of the Father. And therefore, if I'm going to see that as a main movement in the sermon, I'd better read up my systematics on why the ascension of Jesus is so important. So why, why the ascended Christ, why is that such an important thing? Why is that such an important doctrine? Number two, Peter's understanding from verse 12 of why Judas did what he did. And then the third section of this chapter starts in verse 21 when they decide who is going to replace Judas. Is it going to be Joseph, verse 23, or Matthias? And verse 26, for the last time in Scripture, we see the lot is cast. It is never cast again because the Holy Spirit is about to come and the lot falls to Matthias. So I'm going to talk there about the ascended Christ. I'm going to talk about Peter's understanding of events through Scripture. So he interprets, notice, uh, Judas, and he interprets Judas through his understanding of what, uh, of, of what the Psalms say and then of guidance with regard to the lot. Okay, week three, how to be fully and forever equipped. We now come to the day of Pentecost and your experience of the Holy Spirit. What is happening on the day of Pentecost? Now notice I've divided the Pentecostal event from the Pentecostal sermon, 2, 1 to 13 and 8, 14 to 17. What happens on the day of Pentecost? The 120 are there. You have tongues of fire, so you can see the Spirit coming on them in tongues of fire and you can hear the effect. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, verse 4, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The word is glosa, so here is glosolalia, tongues. Verse 6 tells us, When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking their own dialecto. So the word here is dialect. It is an actual language. And it is repeated down there in verse 11, as glosolalia again, we heard them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Now, what is the miracle here? I take it that it is a miracle of speech. These 15 language groups are all hearing in their own tongue the wonders of God, that is the gospel, from people who are not trained in that language. And so you've got a reversal of Babel. You've got the scrambling of the languages at Babel. Now you've got the uniform language, but they are not hearing one language they are hearing 15 different languages. So I think that's really important um, because my wife and I went to the British Museum to the Hajj exhibition where they take you on the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca. 
And what is amazing about that is that every Muslim who goes to Mecca looks like every other Muslim who goes to Mecca. So there's that incredible uniformity which is so encouraging to them. So what you see here, they keep their culture, they keep their language, 15 different of them. What unites them is the wonders of God. What unites them is the gospel. But it is not, notice that they are uniform, there's great diversity in that. And they hear them declaring the wonders of God in their own tongue. And so the Holy Spirit comes, he enables ministry, and the Holy Spirit is the one who enables us and equips us for ministry to take the gospel out. Now we come to the sermon in Pentecost, week four, and it's all about the Lord Jesus. Peter jumps up, he's an opportunistic preacher. He says, this is what Joel was about. One, the spirit, there's coming the day when the Spirit will come without distinction of age, young and old, sex, men and women, and social status, your servants, manservants and maidservants. This is a day, verse 21, of opportunity when this comes because it's a day in which when people call on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. Now, this is the day. It's happening from today. And what is the wonders of God? This man, Jesus of Nazareth, was handed over to you, verse 23, by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you put him to death by nailing him to the cross. God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David says this, verse 27, you will not let your Holy One see decay, but I can tell you David saw decay, so he wasn't writing about himself. He was writing about his greater son. Verse 31, seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God raised this Jesus to life. We are all witnesses of the fact, exalted to the right hand. He's poured out the Holy Spirit you can now see and hear. Verse 36, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So here is the emphasis. It's all of it on about Jesus. What are the wonders of God? What God has done through Jesus. And it's about his life. Death couldn't hold him down. It had no grip on Jesus. He said to his enemies, who convicts me of sin? They had nothing on him. All they could say was, well, he eats with the wrong people occasionally. Now, if I said to my friends, who can convict me of sin? They would have no hesitation. Jesus lived a perfect life, so death had no grip on him. And it's his perfect life, which is the ground of his substitutionary death. And God shows the reality that he has accepted the substitutionary death of Jesus by raising him from the dead. The resurrection, therefore, is the warranty. It is the divine warranty that God has accepted Jesus. And the coming of the Spirit is the final truth that Jesus is at the right-hand side of God and he has poured out the Holy Spirit. It's all about Jesus, 22, 14 to 47. And the, the, the command is to repent and be baptised. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and forgiveness. And notice the new covenant community is described for us in verse 42. They have fellowship together. They share together. It's just a wonderful community and people want to be a part of it. Just look at the way Luke contrasts the new covenant community with the old covenant community. Chapter 3. Israel knew, according to Deuteronomy, that you were not to have any beggars in your midst. But here is a beggar. Because Israel was to be an open-handed community, there was to be sharing. That's exactly what you see in the new covenant community. But the old covenant community has depreciated to the extent that even outside the gate called beautiful, you have this pitiable sight of a man who is a crippled beggar. Doesn't Israel know they're not to have beggars in their midst? And so you have the irony that Luke says outside a gate beautiful twice, you have this pitiable sight. And the first sign or wonder that we see is of a man in a book which is all about momentum, who has no momentum. He's not going anywhere. I just want you to notice that there's a distinct contrast between the Old Covenant community in chapter 3 and their closed-handedness and the open-handed generosity of the New Covenant community in chapter 2. The Gospel makes a difference. Now we come week 6, week 5, the triumphant indicative. Here is the indicative. This is what God has done. Verses 1 to 10. 
uh, the man who is over 40 years of age. This is a remarkable miracle. Um, he has no muscle tone because he has never walked. Uh, verse 7, Peter takes him by the right hand, helps him up. Instantly the man's feet and ankles become strong because Peter has said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. He went walking, verse 8, walking twice, verse 9, walking again, jumping and praising God. So it's a remarkable, it's a remarkable sign. And Peter opportunistically stands up then and preaches the sermon from verse 11 through to the end. And he says that the Lord Jesus has done this. He hasn't done it. And he calls on the nation to turn back to him because uh, there is the sign and here is the sermon, the triumphant indicative. What did Gresham Machen say? Christianity is marked by the triumphant indicative. This is what God has done. This is what you must do. But what God has done always precedes what you should do. It's fascinating, isn't it? When you study Romans, for example, you're preaching through Romans and what you notice is that there is one verb mood you are never seeing and that is the imperative. There is no command in Romans until you get to chapter 6 and then you're told to do something with your mind. So you've got this indicative, 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 indicative. Here's an imperative at last the triumphant indicative. This is what God has done and this therefore is what you must do. The prophet like Moses has come, therefore you should repent and turn back to God. All right, that brings us to the end of week five and uh, then we'll get on to chapter four and hostility uh, when we come back later. But we're going to have, we've been going for an hour and 20. I think we should have a small break, okay?